Hi guys. So today we're going to talk about garbage. The stuff that you put in a bin, gets picked up by the truck and disappears into some far away mystery land. Well today I'd like to introduce you to Margaret Rock, who is from that mystery land. He's here to talk about how to reduce waste, how we can reuse waste, and how sustainability plays a role in all of that. Um, so the floor is yours, Mark. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and a bit exciting for me because it's my debut on the, on the roof. I've done this before in my other school, but uh, not on the university yet. So thank you for choosing uh, being here. And uh, today I will try to tell you some more about the way we treat waste and uh, what we can do as individuals to prevent waste because it all starts with preventing uh, waste become something becoming waste and at the end of the day this is this is our business so 10 million tons of waste produced in the Netherlands by all of us and it's uh, up to you at the end of the day to see if this is wasted time yes or no hey good morning good morning hello so, my motto today is let's do it wiser, and wiser stands for waste as a source of sustainable energy and sustainable resources, second generation resources. So it's copyright, I did 25 years getting that far that I think that wiser should be the thing. So, I'm 56 years old, I, I started my career as a seafarer, I was a merchant captain for some years, and then the mobile telephones kicked in, <laughs> so, So I started my career at sea, and uh, I did that for eight years, and uh, when I was a young boy I, I always wanted to be a pilot, so the second best was to go at sea, but that life is, is very, uh, uh, it's, it's a hard life, and, and in my time there was no uh, internet, there was no Skype or thing, things like that, so I had a very limited look at the world and uh, politics and stuff like that. So then I joined uh, a job in a, in a factory that reused paper to make carpet uh, board. And uh, that opened my eyes because I saw this huge amount of paper that we produce and we collect and reuse in a factory to make new carpet out of it. So it kicked in my mind and uh, I thought, well, this, this, this is a good way of looking at stuff that we throw away and uh, how to reuse it. So from that moment on, uh, I thought I skipped it. So from that moment on, I looked at uh, recycling with a whole other look. And that was the moment I started my career. In, uh, in the recycling business, and I'm in that business now for over 20 years, and uh, it's, it's a quite uh, interesting world, and it gives me the idea that we, we do a lot of good stuff, because 10 million tons of waste every year produced in the Netherlands is a lot, and if you throw it away, and that's not only in the Netherlands, but worldwide, then we, you can imagine we, we will have a resource problem, and we have a resource problem already, but you have to, uh, uh, you have to think about it more often to, to know that, 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 that it's going on already. So today, after my introduction, uh, I, I would love to have an interactive uh, workshop with you. 
So if there is a question or if you want to make a remark, please do so on the spot because that makes it a bit more alive and uh, I'm here to answer your questions. So I prepared a program, but that's not in that's not rock solid. So if there is a topic you want to talk about and it's waste related or recycling related, please say so and I'll try my best to uh, to answer your questions or to give way to the discussion. I will talk a bit about our company um, because with our corporate movies for instance I can show you a lot about the size and the, uh, the, the size of our factories and the way we produce waste into sustainable energy or resources. Then a bit about new business development, that's my thing. I'm a new business developer. So I try to um, develop stuff, processes, new products that will give us a chance, for instance, in five or ten years to still be in business. Because our business is changing rapidly. And for instance, carbon dioxide, um, if, if the prices which are something like 5 euros per ton at the moment, rise up to 80 euros per ton carbon dioxide, then that will mean that our business will be totally different and I have to try to look in the future and think about how we can match the future as it evolves. Um, one specific topic, which is actually in Groningen as well, is what's, what's the best? post-separate waste or uh, source-separate waste. Yeah. So that's a discussion I, I will try to uh, tell something about. And then we can wrap up and, uh, and have some discussion. So that's the program. Is there a specific topic already you want to talk about, which is not on the list or which isn't covered by the list? So please say so. I would like you to stand up because it's Monday morning. Please stand up. And I have a specific task for you. Morning. Hello. Marco. Hi. So, Cora, you're just in time to. Uh, <laughs> so, when, when you found a seat, when you find a seat, then um, think about yeah, your 30 seconds to think about the following. I want you to make a 360 turn, but you have to do it in a, in a certain way, and you have to think about this way. So, 10 seconds to think about how you will make your 360 turn, and then turn at my mark. <coughs> <laughs> okay. Turn. Okay. Did, did you notice how your neighbor turned? Was it different as your turn? Yeah. Why? What? It's opposite direction. The opposite well, direction. Yeah. Did you notice any differences? Um, not really, but now I know that. <laughs> Did you turn quickly or slowly? Sorry. You jumped, Joey? Sorry, my yeah. <laughs> yeah? No. Who did something different? Okay. Well, if we could have turned this way. Oh, yeah, that would have been possible. Yeah. So, but what's the, what's the common goal we achieved? Everybody turned 360 degrees. So you start like this, and you're back in this position. So the way you turn is not that special and exciting as long as your target, your goal is achieved. So thank you. I'll come back to that. But remember. Okay, uh, something about material. 
you know, waste in incineration, eh? it, up to the 80s, 90s of the uh, past century, we did a lot of lift in it. So a big deep, a big pile of rubbish, 40 meters into the air, and sometimes a kilometer long, deep, and all stuff was landfill. Then waste to energy plants kicked in. So incineration was the new topic. Nowadays, we incinerate what's left and all the products, all the stuff that cannot be recycled in any useful way. So we compost a lot, the green waste, the garden uh, and kitchen waste, for instance, is composted into, uh, into compost. Oh, oh, oh. We digest. <laughs> when you touch it, it goes. Yeah, but I don't touch it. So, <laughs> so oh, I, when I touch yeah, this, ah. it, yeah. <laughs> so that's. That we, we can't pay that kind of stuff, so <laughs> I'm not used to that. So, um, if, we, uh, if we separate our waste and we have garden and kitchen waste, then we can make compost out of that. There is a lot of organic waste in the material that has to be incinerated. We take it out and we digest it into green gas. And we separate it. So our incinerators, especially that one in Weister, has a separation unit prior to the uh, to the incinerator. <laughs> no, when, when I wanted to, to, to skip, then it didn't. So we look at it here in Groningen, of course. We have a plant at the near the Winschoten Diep, so at the east side of Groningen. We have a very large plant in Wijster, then in Apeldoorn and a lot in Limburg and Brabant. We are not located in the west of the Netherlands. <coughs> so, uh, incineration and uh, separation and landfills. There are a lot of landfills, but they are not active anymore. So, that's uh, history. So, my special thing and our special thing within Atero is to upgrade material. So recycling is one thing, but upgrading is another one. And I'll tell you some more about that today. Some of the basic principles. So, have you seen something like this before? Oh. Um, if we talk about upgrading, do you ever hear of the ladder of Lansing? Well, Lansing was a politician. And he thought about the way that you can upgrade material. Um, it's a compilation of the Ladder of Lansing and some new thinking. But the minimum rate you want to achieve when you look at waste is to make green energy out of it. So our incinerator produces more than 50% green electricity. Then better is to um, take the resources out of the waste. So, for instance, plastics or celluloses can be uh, can be reused. And if I try to open this, if you reuse plastics, then of course you save an enormous amount of fossil fuels. And uh, you can pass it on, please. And, and um, by saving these fossil fuels, you save a lot of carbon dioxide as well. One step even better is to reuse stuff that gets into the food chain again. So minimal pet food or animal food, large animals like cows. But sometimes you can recycle it in such a way that it's human, uh, it's, it's uh, you, uh, humans can consume it as well, and the pharmacy is the absolute top. So if you can make medicine out of the stuff you take out of the waste, like fungus, and, and 
stuff like that, then the pharmacy is the absolute top. So this is the way we think. We always aim for the top, but of course that's not always possible, or most of the time that's not possible. So minimal green, minimum green energy production, and a lot is being reused as resources in one or the other way. So that's in our logo as well. <coughs> we have a technical loop and a biological loop, and if we integrate them, then recycling and recreation is possible. <coughs> so that's our business, but something else I want to point out to you is that the Dutch water boards are doing absolutely the same as we do. Water boards talk about the energy factory and the, the resource factory, and in fact that's absolutely the same as we do. So if you look at the wet and the dry waste together in the Netherlands, then we have an enormous, enormous amount of waste, and everybody looks at treating the waste in the same way. So water boards, for instance, make green energy as well out of our shit. And um, uh, they try to um, make nutrients out of our poop as well. And that's what we do, for instance, with phosphorus or with kalium or nitrogen. We try to take it out of the waste streams and recycle it in such a way that fertilizer can be uh, uh, produced in a, well, in a more sufficient and uh, sustainable way. Um, as I told you already, our factory in Dijster, we call it an incinerator, but in fact it's not 100% incinerator. The, this part is the traditional part. So this is where you put in your fuel, which is waste in our case. You uh, put it into the kettles in the ovens. You make a lot of heat. The heat is transferred into steam. And the steam is, uh, um, is the source for a turbine generator system which produces electricity. So, in a traditional incinerator, you have fuel, you have steam, you have a turbine generator, and you have electricity. In our case, that's about 48 megawatts of electric energy produced, which, is, which covers about 250,000 households uh, in the Netherlands. By the way, 1% of all the sustainable uh, no, of all the energy produced in the Netherlands is from incinerators. If we look at the amount of sustainable energy, it's equal to what we do with solar and wind power. So it's a, it's a large amount of energy produced. In the Weister plant, if we put in one... Yes? Do you capture the heat as well when you're going through this process? Yes, thank you for the question. The, the, the heat, of course, is transferred into steam. Uh, the steam can be transferred into electricity over the turbine generator line. But we sell a lot of our heat direct as well, because there is more efficiency the moment we sell our heat than if you convert it into electricity, because there is a 25% a efficiency if you make energy, uh, electricity, out of, uh, out of steam. And there is almost a 100% efficiency if you sell it as steam, as heat. So that's, that, that's a very important uh, issue at our plant in Weister, to sell the steam direct. <coughs> so Weister, if we put in 1 million tons of waste as fuel, <coughs> we put it through a separation unit <coughs> before the incinerator. And here, half of all the materials that are in the waste are coming out as some kind of resource. So we have a mixture of plastics and paper, which is a lot, I'll show you later on, a lot of organic waste, and the rest is refuse derived fuel, which we call RDF, which is fueled into the steam. So almost half is 
before incineration, coming out as a resource, and the other half is incinerated. That makes Weister special. Our plant in Groningen separates as well. So if you live in Groningen, and I presume that a lot of you do, then you know that there is only a grey bin in Groningen. So all your waste is put in the grey bin and is separated in our Groningen plant. So half of your materials are being uh, incinerated and the other half are upcycled or upgraded into resources that we reuse again. So if we look at Weister and we look at, at it simplified, and I had no time to translate everything, so I'll give you an idea. But if we put in 1.2 million tons of waste and we put in some uh, stuff to help us to separate and incinerate, then we produce energy, products, resources, and we have something we call the, 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 in fact, the incinerator. So, there's a lot of uh, plastics, compost, heat, steam, uh, uh, electricity, fuel, paper and other fibers that we can reuse. Metals, chemical uh, stuff like uh, glucose for instance, I'll come back to that as well. A lot of green gas and a lot of other types of fuel. Did you know that Groningen, today, eh, if today is something like 15, 16 degrees Celsius, the whole city of Groningen is fueled by green gas. So that's gas from a non-fossil origin. And a lot of people don't, don't know that all the, the, the gas lines in Groningen are fed in by the Suikerunie on the west side and they produce something like 10 million cubic meters of green gas and we produce 10 million as well at the east side of Groningen so all the gas pipes in Groningen when it's not too cold are completely filled with green gas so Groningen is a, is a beautiful example of a city that's very sustainable when it comes to gas. But gas in Groningen is a dirty word. I live in Harkstede, which is something like six kilometers in that way. And uh, some mornings I wake up two, three o'clock in the night because my whole bed is shaking. And uh, I, I remember the first time it was really scary because I thought somebody with a whip stood over our house and, and something like thunder. I, I never knew that an earthquake comes with a lot of noise and a lot of rumbling and stuff. So it was not only the shaking, but the, the, the heavy punches and the, the big kind of noise I heard was very scary. So I can imagine that there is, a, there is some emotion when it comes to using gas in Groningen. But I want to tell you that as long it's, as, as we talk about green gas, so the, the, the gas produced out of waste, it's, it's, uh, it's not a problem. So skip the fossil gas and go for the green gas, which we and Cyberuni and other farmers produce. <coughs> okay, decomposition of household waste. I have to look at my note because I made these notes and I... And yes. What is the temperature limit from like when it starts not only being green gas? Well, it, like something like 15, 14, 15 degrees. So the, 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 moments, the moment people start um, fueling their houses, yeah, warming up their houses, then the, the demand is too high to, uh, to fill it up with green gas. Then fossil gas kicks in as well. Yeah. So, uh, decomposition of waste. Um, how do you know there are prices to be won? 
we have uh, a lot of prizes to give away today. So, um, I want you to do a guess. Or are there any experts today? Because then I skipped the quiz. It wouldn't be fair, no experts, okay. So, where, where does waste, household waste, consists out of? Any idea? Who wants to do a guess? Plastics. Plastics, how much? Percentage, weight? 60% 60. 60 plastics, okay. 15 maybe. 15% plastics? And what more? Organic matter. Organic matter, how much? 30%. Mm. <coughs> I see you won the price already. <laughs> 30% organics. What more? Cartons. Cartons. Paper. I think about 15%. 15%. What do you Even throw away? Wood. Even wood, yeah. wood, yeah. Furniture. Yeah. Coaches. And metals a lot. Yeah. Or a lot, but, but not a lot in percentage, but if you look at the total amount, I, I think it's a lot. So I give you an idea. Who knows something about the um, EU directives for waste or the Dutch governmental targets we have when it comes to reducing waste? Well, let's see. Um, if we look at the the waste over the years, so 93, 2016, there was a lot of uh, economic uh, stuff going on in, let's say, the, uh, the beginning of the 90s, but if you look at the way the three northern provinces, we, 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 we took out the, uh, we took this graph, then you can see that, that the amount of waste pro inhabitant is almost stable over the years. So that tells us something about the amount of waste we produce and, and what's the connection between produced waste and our behavior. How does waste comes into the world? It all starts with what? Buying stuff. Buying stuff, consuming, yeah, that, that's the whole issue. And if you look at the, um, the waste itself, eh, and you look at the stuff you buy, any idea where the biggest amount of plastics, for instance, are related to, if you look at your waste? So if you look at in, in your own bin, where do plastics come from? Package. Package. Packaging material. It's huge. I, I do not live in a, in a, uh, in, in Harkstead, we, we don't uh, separate as well eh, our waste. But I did an experiment and I took all my plastics for one week and I separated it. And it was really ridiculous to see how much plastics are related to packaging material. And I had these cookies, and they were wrapped in four times. So every cookie was plastified. Then five cookies were together. Then they were in this nice uh, plastic thing, and it was wrapped in again. So it's really, it's really a, a problem. But what is one big issue when it comes to packaging? Would you buy your cookies if they were at Albert Heijn in this big open bin and you can grab out and your neighbor grabs out. Would you buy them? Sure. You would buy them. <laughs> okay. Who would buy them more? And if I just clean my toilet and it's obvious I did because I smell and I and I grab in this <laughs> bag of cookies just before you want to buy them. What does but it would be you rethink? 
In India, we do it because people they wash their hands properly. <laughs> oh yeah, but I didn't. <laughs> I know. But, yeah. but so wouldn't be like the the bakeries, and then you have these uh, small. Um, yeah, call it, then these clippers. So you pick them up. Yes. Then you don't need to use your hands. Of course, but that, that, that's the issue. Some some <laughs> businesses try to uh, to sell their stuff in such a way, but there, there is um, there are laws as well in place that prevent us from buying stuff in that way. So so, but that's the way we would have to rethink our consuming. The moment we want to diminish the the amount of plastics that are involved, but and please if remember, if plastics are recycled. All of them. There's no problem, or is there still a problem? I don't well, of, of of course, if you would recycle all your waste, you could say, well, there is no problem. But as long as there's waste involved, you have to put a lot of energy in recycling this yeah. stuff. Okay. So it starts with collecting your bin then drive it into the factory, then all the energy to, to sort the material. So I think prevention would always be the better option. But, but if you can't prevent anymore, then of course, then recycling is, is the better option. Is it possible in itself to recycle plastic? <laughs> so it is melted and then reused? Or? I'll come back to that. So please uh, remember your question. So, but let's, let's be, um, let's, let's remember that the amount of waste over the years isn't that uh, fluctuating as we think. Well, if you look at the totals, and I, I won't go into this very deep, but the total amount of household waste in the Netherlands, and this is a few years old, was 8.3 million tons, which is about 10 million tons at the moment. And these are all the different sorts that are involved. So you have the garden and kitchen waste. And um, of course there is a lot of what we call grof uh, afval, so the, the, the bigger <coughs> stuff like your furniture or these kind of things. Um, there's glass a lot of involved packaging material um, there's a lot of stuff reused of course eh? so if, if, if you go to Mama Mini here in Groningen who knows Mama Mini if you are limited on a budget you have to know Mama Mini you can buy fantastic stuff for um, little money and that keeps the materials away from our business which uh, you could think, well, I'm, I'm fond of a lot of waste. Well, we are not. We are the preventers as well. So, mattresses. Large amount, big amounts of mattresses uh, that, that are collected every week. And they are a problem as well, because of all the different materials involved. And they are very voluminous, of course. Um, how do you say a friture fit? What's the um, if if you bake your fries if, in this uh, oily stuff? Huge amounts. Um, so that's the composition of waste, and, and and this is roughly how we see it if we look at the residual waste, which is the waste that is collected in the grey bin the moment you stopped separation. So you separated your waste at home and what's left in the grey bin consists about 33% organic, paper and cardboard 20% and plastics 14 So you were near. <coughs> Glass, textiles, diapers, this is a growing market incontinence products in 20 years I will use one as well I think so <laughs> uh, they, they, these are evolving markets <laughs> um, if we look at the whole of the Netherlands you see the same picture organic material 36 
paper and carton, 20, and plastics in general, something like 7%. So these are the materials that make waste. And uh, the top four, top five products are mentioned here. <coughs> if we look at the northern provinces, then we see that there is about five to six hundred kilograms pro inhabitant every year waste. And uh, there is post-separated material and there is the residual waste which is left in the grey bin. And this gives you the idea that there is something like 400 kilograms pro inhabitant recycled because it is post-separated. Well, forget it. I'll come back to that. These figures are from the local governments and they like to show them. But in fact, they are not actual. But I'll show you later on. Um, so, the Dutch government. You know van, which, which is van afval naar grondstof. So, from waste to resources, which is a program in the Netherlands. And the program tells us that in 2020, the total amount of waste pro inhabitant has to be 400 kilograms. There, where we are at the moment, somewhere in the range of 5 to 600 kilograms. So, you have to consume. 100 kilogram less by 2020, otherwise you'll be imprisoned. Because they're, they are very strict when it comes to these figures. We think it's impossible, because the moment we consume the way we do, the amount of waste I showed you before will be the same over all the years. So, either you stop consuming at least 20% less, or we won't reach these targets. So, that, that's a fact. And there is a sub-target as well. So, this is the total amount that has to be less. But then the residual waste has to um, become less as well. And in 2020, it's now somewhere in the 250 kilograms range. It, it has to be more than or less than uh, 100 kilograms per person. So again, 400, 3, 400 kilograms have to be post-separated and recycled, otherwise we won't reach these, these goals. Let's imagine that we see a reduction of 3% every year, which is a lot. I can assure you. Then, even then, we will not make the goal uh, that easy as said, because 2020 we ought to be at 100 kilograms already, but now it will be something like 2040. So this is a real ambitious, a really ambitious goal, and, and I don't think we can match unless we start consuming less or using this packaging material. <coughs> this, in this graph I try to uh, show you that even when we, we have 100% uh, waste composition, eh, which is here, so the green waste, the uh, diapers, glass, <coughs> metals, stuff like that, in kilos um, pro inhabitant, in total it's something like 220, the, the, the graph I showed you before. If you start recycling, you cannot reach 100% efficiency. It's impossible, because material is dirty, there is a lot of stuff uh, in plastics, for instance, which isn't plastic, so we have to take it out. So if you achieve these efficiency figures, then the really potential to recycle is something like 120 kilos. 
Then there is a efficiency. Uh, um, in Germany, they, they have something. They want you to match a certain certain purity. They want you to match, which is called the DKM. So if we take that into account as well, then in potential there's something like 34 kilograms of really um, reusable material, which can be uh, transferred into virgin, virgin-like plastics again when it comes to plastic. So 220 kilograms and 34 kilograms of possible resource doesn't fill the gap that we saw just, just before, which is about 300 kilograms. So, um, waste is like Hans Klok, you know, the, mag the, the magician. He, he does like this and then the waste is gone. Well, it won't be gone, but it's transferred into another system, which is tricky. How come they do that? Uh, well, that's... That's almost the same as I just told you before. So, how to achieve this objective? How to be sure that our 400 kilogram of waste, which is reduced into 100 kilograms of residual waste, so let's say 300 kilograms of waste is reused in a proper way, how can we achieve that? We talked about the packaging material already and the hygiene, which is a, a, a real topic. So we, there are people that, that they are convinced of the fact that we need packaging material to guarantee hygiene and freshness of our food. I, in fact, you, you, you had this workshop one week or two weeks ago about food. What, what did that lecture tell you about hygiene? and packaging rules. Did you talk about that? <laughs> well, uh, I, I think if, if we look at waste, so let's say this, this organic material, this 30-34% which is contained into residual waste or waste in general, together with the garden waste, which is double that much, so about 150 kilograms of organic waste is produced by us every year. Where does it consist out? So I have no garden. If, if you have no garden, where does the organic waste come from? Food. food. Yeah. Large amounts of food. And do you know how much, for instance, meat brings the carbon dioxide? Problem. So the production of one kilo of meat, who, who knows? What, what does it mean when it comes to making use of clean water? 6,000 liters. One kilo of meat is 6,000 liters of clean water. Well, it's a lot. I thought it was 1,000 liters, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Never mind. It, there's a lot of clean water involved. And then the methane production. If a cow farts, and you have a lighter at the back of this cow, it'll go into, the, in, into orbit, because <laughs> it's terrible. So the methane production of cows is, is enormous. So uh, less consumption, less meat, means a better environment. Uh, all the, the food waste produced is, a, is an enormous amount of materials that we throw away, and, and I, I think it's, it's ridiculous. If you look at supermarkets, the, the amount of waste they throw away, it's ridiculous. But uh, I'll come back to that as well. So, at the end of the day, I think the 400 kilograms is not realistic the moment we don't start thinking about the way we produce waste and the amount of stuff we throw away. Um, now something else, post and source separation. 
we started today with this 360 uh, turn we made and I wanted to show you that whatever you do, source separation or post separation, as long as you achieve your goal, then there is no problem. If, if the success is equal, then there is no difference. Who knows the difference about, do you all know the post and uh, source separation discussion? Did, did you, do you talk about it? If you live in Groningen, for instance, eh, the politics in Groningen are talking about post and source separation now. So in uh, source separation, you separate your waste at home. Several collectors collect your bins and all the materials. And what happens after that? It's a big thing and then the garbage goes through and at first, I understand is that the, like having things go down and then there's also chemical process involved, so you store like plastic and glass and uh, things like that. I'm not sure if that's... Now, but let's say that you, you have a post-separation process installed in, 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 in Groningen and your plastic is separated in a, a blue bin. So the blue bin is collected. What happens after? after the moment your bin is collected. But I hope they don't put it together again. You hope they don't put it together. Okay. <laughs> but it has to be reviewed, <laughs> like still I have to check there's only plastic. So. Okay, is, is, there, <coughs> is there a kind of plastic which is... Um, no, are plastics all the same? No. No. How many sorts of plastics are there? Twelve. Twelve. <laughs> thousand. Thousand. Oh, thousand. Ooh, I see prices again. <laughs> thousand. Well, I don't know how many, <laughs> but there are a lot for sure. And it must be hundreds, at least. So perhaps even thousand. I, I don't know. But a lot of materials that we collect as being plastics cannot be produced as being new plastics again, without sorting them, without washing them, and without upgrading, upgrading them in such a way that they can be plastics again. So, what happens if you source separate? What's your incentive to separate your waste at home? If you don't really get fined? You get fined. Okay, so that's a, neg a negative incentive, but for sure it's an, ex it's an incentive. Well, they do that somewhere in Honingen, that if you don't separate your garbage, then... Oh yeah, you can be fined, for sure. Mm. So, so that's it's what. It's cheaper, right? In the, in the rent, if we put the plastic separately, I don't think they weigh the plastic, but they weigh the grey. Okay, so it's cheaper because your plastics are being collected for less money than your re residual waste, so it's cheaper. Uh, surely most people have the illusion that it's better for the environment. Yeah. Um, I don't know because I'm, I can't see what happens afterward. Okay, okay. So, let's, let's keep in mind, as real Dutchmen, it's cheaper. So. A Dutchman always goes for the money. If I, uh, if I fill up my tank with gas, and I don't fill up my tank with gas because I, I drive all, all electric, but some years ago, when, when, when I filled up my tank, I drove three kilometers because of two cents per liter and this stupid cart. <laughs> and everything, every time I thought about it, I said, well, you're, you're absolutely crazy. But it's something in my Dutch mind that brings me to driving three kilometers to get these 60 cents on my car. So, if we look at the pricing of waste, for sure you're right. The moment something is cheaper, we are um, willing to, to separate in the first cheapest way. But uh, it's, very, it's very strange that you pay... Uh, Flat rate, you pay, at least we pay, uh, I think, more than half 
for just collecting, and then they weigh it, and that's the rest. So if every all the pr the price would be all on weight, that would be much more of an incentive. And yeah. They fast yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are so, several forms of yeah. Course, yeah? So you have diftar in you have frequency diftar. So the um, the amount of times you 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 place your bin yeah. at the street will be uh, your your incentive to pay. Um, there is uh, uh, weight as an incentive, but still, it's the pricing that brings us to bringing uh, something into your bin and picking the green bin or the blue bin or the yellow bin. So pricing is, is something for sure. I think it's the wrong incentive. Um, and the only thing we want to be sure of, that all the resources are being brought into the system again on the best possible way. And um, that should be our aim. Now, I realize that I totally forgot you to show you <laughs> a movie I planned. So, please forgive me, um, but I will make it up <coughs> to you. How do I uh, come into my sticky? So let's. Uh, did, did you see the corporate movie already? No, you didn't. So let's start with Atero as a whole. As market leader in the Netherlands, Atero processes some 3.5 million tons of waste on an industrial scale per year. More than 100,000 lorries with a total length of 1,800 kilometers. This is waste from households and companies in the Netherlands, England and Ireland. We use this to generate sustainable energy and to recover all the raw materials. Electricity, heat, green gas, but also plastic, metals, soil improvers and construction materials. This is how Atero makes an active and substantial contribution to a greener and more sustainable society. Our energy from waste plants are amongst the world's best. Like in Wardyke, its four thermal treatment lines produce high pressure steam. That is unique in the world of waste incineration. In this way, our plant supplies more energy than traditional incinerators. The plant is operated continuously and fully automatically controlled. The current throughput is around 1 million tons annually. With our knowledge, experience and continuous improvements to our processing plants, we recover the maximum amount of energy from residual waste from the Netherlands and imported from abroad. To ensure the supply of energy and heat for the future, Atero is now building a 120 megawatt state-of-the-art steam turbine power plant in Mordo. Our energy from waste plant in Weister has a unique integrated pretreatment and sorting activity. This allows us to separate out materials like metals, paper, plastics and organics to produce biogas. Oil separators and infrared equipment extract plastic packaging materials from the remnant waste. The sophisticated flue gas cleaning of the Weister plant effectively minimizes emissions and is amongst the cleanest in the world. Atero is developing strongly in terms of sorting source-separated and post-separated plastic packaging and drinks cartons. In our ingenious sorting facility, we produce, with effective equipment, subsequently a number of recyclable monostreams. This is how we save on fossil fuels and provide industry with valuable resources, metals, power and construction materials. Cotero is innovative and continuously improves its performance and organization. Waste processing has to be an optimum balance between economic returns and the effects of that processing. We all know that waste is valuable. We digest and compost organic material. We are market leader in producing compost and sustainable green gas. They are true recycled products that are produced and used regionally. This is how we provide our soil with essential and sustainable soil improvers and make our agriculture and horticulture more sustainable. 
This is a terror's origin. These are our roots. One of our precursors, Vum, was incorporated back in 1929 to process waste from the Hague local authority. They turned it into compost with the objective of transforming the poor reclamation areas in Drenthe into fertile land. This killed two birds with one stone. The Hague solved its waste problem and the quality of the soil in Drenthe improved. We laid strong foundations for our company in other parts of the country too. We've built on that. Otero has transshipment stations, energy from waste plants, digesters, compost factories, gas factories, separation and sorting plants, and landfills all over the Netherlands. Otero considers itself a supplier of raw materials generated from waste destined for new products. We constantly optimize our recycling processes and our processing facilities. We innovate through intelligent combinations of proven technology. This is how we ensure more sustainable business operations and business continuity. With our geographic spread, range of processing options, optimum access, including railway and waterway connections, and our available buffer capacity, we offer our clients solutions and customized options. Our clients are never stuck with their waste. That is our strength. Otero has four operational landfills where we process a minimum amount of waste that can't be reused due to safety or environmental reasons. We also manage various former landfills. We purify the released wastewater, capture and use the landfill gas and seal landfills responsibly for the future. Safety and dealing carefully with our environment are at the top of our agenda. We want our people and those who work for us or visit our sites to return home safely at the end of their working day. We're always looking for new and intelligent ways to work more efficiently and at lower costs. That is how we support clients with their waste policy and help them to achieve their environmental objectives. We see waste as a source of raw materials and energy. Our employees put all their knowledge and skills into processing waste in an environmentally friendly and socially responsible way. That is how we achieve maximum results for our shareholders, clients and the neighbours of our sites. So, and before the break, just to give you the opportunity to discuss a bit already about plastics, Atero has a long history when it comes to the separation of municipal waste. In 1980, we built the first large-scale separation plant in Europe for the recovery of plastics, paper, metals and organic waste. Since then, all is dedicated to the optimization of our separation processes. With our knowledge, experience and our operational plants in Weister and Groningen, we recover the maximum amount of raw materials from residual waste. A large shaking screen separates household waste into three streams of different sizes and an organic fraction. Film grabbers, near-infrared separators, take out the plastic packaging materials and beverage cartons. The organic fraction is processed into an anaerobic digester to produce biogas and then upgraded to green gas. The remainder is used as fuel to produce <coughs> steam for neighboring industry and renewable energy for around 100,000 households. <coughs> the packaging materials are sent to our adjacent state-of-the-art sorting plant. Here we also process packaging materials separated at the source by Dutch residents. <coughs> the sorting facility consists of an ingenious combination of effective separation techniques and a sophisticated control system. The result is a separation into eight different monoflows of different packing materials, like bottles, flacons, tubs, cartons, tins, etc. These find their way to the specialized industry for further processing and recycling. Otero is investing strongly in terms of recycling source-separated and post-separated plastic packaging and drinks cartons. We annually process 60,000 tons of this packaging waste. Our next step is the shredding and washing of plastic films into a pure raw material. We then remelt it to high quality granulates as the base for the production of a variety of plastic products. This way, Atero contributes to the transition towards a circular economy by recycling plastics and organic waste into reusable materials and green energy. 
So, time for a cup of coffee. Would you drink your coffee, by the way, in these cups? And for those who don't read Dutch, it says something like, uh, these cups are made out of cellulose that is recovered from the sewer. So please feel free, these are the beta cups we didn't use them yet, but used toilet paper made into paper cups. So feel free to use them. You won't eat one, why not? You don't like the idea? I like it. Uh, nice. Okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> <laughs>
So, are you allowed to put it in? What, what plastics are you allowed in general to put in your plastic container at home? Just packages, I think. Sorry, again? Just packages, like one usable. Packaging material. That's the, that's the issue. So, as long as, as it's packaging material, you are allowed. But the fact, the simple fact that you start the, the, the question, the discussion, tells me that the government started collecting plastics and started source separation without you and me knowing what to do. So, so that's, that's a real issue. But it's meant for packaging material. So again, what kind of plastics? I thought it was polystyrene. But polystyrene. No, it's not, but it's a good one. I wouldn't have thought about that one. I don't know all the plastics myself, to be honest. So there are too many. But this is HDPE, high density polyethylene. But you have a lot and a lot and a lot of materials that we call plastics. So, but the main issue when you start source separating is, is it packaging material, yes or no? So, toys for kids can be 100% plastics, but they are not allowed in your bin, which is ridiculous. Because think about the 360 turn, it's about the goal. Hmm. It's not about, is it sorted uh, uh, packaging material, yes or no? So, I, I think there's something funny going on. But again, back to the plastics. What's this? Well, I don't know either, but it's plastic. So, <laughs> this is something like, uh, I think it's polyurethane. or... But you see it a lot <coughs> when it comes to these kind of tubes and foils and stuff. So, there really is a lot and a lot of material. So, again to the hygiene question, what, what's the biggest problem you think when it comes to recovering and reusing plastics from all the materials you can choose from out of? There is one really big problem. Cleaning, I think, because there's a lot of dirty stuff in it. Cleaning, for sure, is an issue. But if you look at the material, we buy a lot. What's the biggest problem when it comes to sorting out plastics and reusing plastics? They're mixed. Mixed versions. Mixed materials. Yeah. Is there a specific material that brings us a, a, a big part of the problem? The pet, the, the pet uh, packaging of meat. You know, the, the black pet material yeah. or the stuff, I don't eat many hamburgers, although you wouldn't say so, but um, the McDonald's uh, stuff, the, 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 the pet uh, bakjes where the hamburgers are in, and, and the, the material where the meat is in, that's very hard to recycle and very, and black material in general is very hard to recognize because of the infrared and the color reflection that isn't there. So, um, if we go back to our discussion um, when we started the, the, the topic, if you look at meat, and, and if you buy meat, would you buy meat that isn't packaged in any form? Of course, in, in, in foreign countries, it they, they do so, but as we are used to our supermarkets and stuff, who would buy meat at a butcher without being packaged? How would you carry it? Hmm? How, would you carry How would you carry your meat? And you can bring your own uh, packages and stuff. <laughs> yeah, ah, I think so. But you would have to, to, bring to organize it. it. Yeah, yes. You have to do so. It's not that but how do you see the future when it comes to packaging material? Why, why can't there be a rule that it's not allowed to have double packaging? <laughs> Just simple rule. Mm -hmm. Only once, not one plastic and <laughs> plastic. 
I don't know why they can't just put some few rules like that <laughs> to put the limit. What would prevent us from implementing a rule like that? So only one way of packaging material. Ah, this uh, lobby maybe. Yeah, yeah. who would lobby for that? We are Dutch. We have two great things: thrifty and lobby. Yeah, so, uh, and rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in fact, <laughs> <laughs> there, <no. laughs> there are a lot of rules. So this is this is one thing I found on the internet, and I, I didn't know this myself, but. If you look at multi-layer materials, so several layers of plastics combined into packaging material, we think that's a big problem because you don't know what to recognize, which layer makes something a certain product. But it has all to do with barriers and food hygiene and stuff like that. So you can read a lot and a lot on the internet about packaging material and the, the different uh, structures and the way they uh, they give us a, a certain hygiene or permit permeability and uh, oxygen um, accept uh, acceptance like a, a membrane. So there is a lot to see, and this is really a problem for us recycling plastics. Um, so these, if we look again at um, source separation versus uh, post separation, if we look at the packaging material, only one third of the source separated plastics can really be reused because of the pollutants uh, that are inside the post-separated material. So if we look at our systems and we sort five different sorts of plastics. So we take the polypropylene, the polyethylene, the foils and a certain mixture of plastics altogether. Then only one third of the amount is really reused. And the other stuff is organic, mostly organic pollutants that have to be taken out before you can reuse them and make them into these granules. This is recycled plastic. How much kg of plastic has this? Sorry? How much kg of plastic has it been? How much? How much kg of plastic has it been before? Oh well, uh, you mean the this this bag? Yeah. This was uh, well, let's say uh, a third. So times three was the source, and then this remains, and the rest was some kind of uh, pollutant that we took out. And where does and the rest go? Sorry? What happens to the rest that is not in there? Well, that's, that's, that's a real good question, because if we, in our facility in Weister, for instance, we have all kinds of means to reuse the organic material. So, the minimum is that we make green gas out of it, out of the organic material, but we can make these cups out of the cellulose that's inside, we can make uh, the plastics out of the cellulose that's can be pro processed into sugars. So we have the means to upgrade it uh, in a proper way. But if you take your plastics, for instance, to Germany, which happens a lot as well, then there is a good chance that the two-thirds of the material goes into another system with a big question mark. And it can be even landfilled again. So the moment you source separate and you think, well, this is good for the environment, there is a good chance that 60% of your material is being landfilled in Poland or wherever. So we have to be sure that the moment you start source separating, that all the materials involved are being reused in the proper way. 
Oh, so then how many times can you recycle uh, the plastics? Can mm. you just recycle them endlessly or does it, does it ever stop? Well, that's a good question as well. Um, for instance, when you look at the recycling of paper, the length of the fiber is important. So paper in, generally, in general can be reused eight times. And then the fiber is that short that you can't reuse it again as being paper. Plastics, as far as I know, can be recycled endlessly as long as they are the, the materials clean. So if you take fossil based plastics and you clean them up to 99.9%, you can reuse them endlessly. Does also um, take different, different amounts of energy to reduce a particular kind of waste? For example, does it take more energy, energy to re uh, recycle plastic or paper or glass? Yes, it does. And uh, it all depends on the, the, the aim you have. So if we reuse these granules and we make them into a product, then you have several steps of energy involved, of course the cleaning and the, the, the sorting, but to make these granules you have to um, extrude them in a, in a certain process that takes a lot of energy, a lot of heat, and then if you want to make them into a product you need the same heat again. But we have carbon dioxide uh, studies done on the recycling of this material, and still from a carbon dioxide point of view, it's better to recycle the fossil material than to make it new out of crude oil. But you still use a lot of carbon dioxide, so... Well, it's the better of two worse things. Because to prevent the use of plastics would be the best option. So would it then also be better to package things in glass or in paper? And, uh... Well, I, I think that's a bit a part of the discussion we, we just had. But to not use packaging material would be the best option. But not using it, and that's what you pointed out, you, you need a, a way to carry your stuff home and to do it on a on a responsible way when it comes to hygiene and stuff like that. So we have to be sure that we use less packaging material and in another way. So if we would make use more of this uh, biodegradable plastics, that would be something because the, the resource is, is the total recycled product and it can be uh, Biodegraded. Yeah, so, is this biodegradable? Um, is it like that you can just basically throw it in the woods and after, say, I don't know, half a year or three years, it's, uh, it has been yeah. uh, decomposed? Yeah. Uh, or is it that you would need uh, also like specific, say, uh, bacteria to uh, de <coughs> uh, degrade it? Well, microorganisms are always involved, eh? but to degrade it, it takes about six weeks in optimal conditions. And optimal means something like moisture and temperature in the, in, in, in the best conditions. Mm -hmm. But max, at maximum, something like two years. Does it also dissolve in water? Or in yeah, it depends again on the conditions. But at the end of the day, it will digrade to, uh, well, something that we won't. Yeah, you don't have to build an industrial process uh, to do that. No, you don't. You, you can compost it in, in some form. Yeah. Could I eat it? Well, have a try. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. I, I think your digestive system would, would have some problems with it. Because you need a, a few weeks. Why is there no rule that? All plastics for packaging should be biodegradable. Just well, because it is there. Uh, who, who, who would know the answer to this one? Yeah, I, I know the answer to that. There is a, I suppose, uh, a, bit, a bit of economics going on where businesses are making a sizable amount of money on uh, 
standard plastics uh, or non-biodegradable. And those people obviously um, need to be in a transition and they will ask for time to transit from their business status now to a maybe biodegradable uh, business over the next 10, 20 years because you know it's, it's, it's very expensive and, and we, we have like um, uh, we, we need to be uh, pricing sharply because otherwise we'll go out of business and blah 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 so I suppose they are trying to uh, increase the time they have to make uh, the maximum amount of profit in the next say 10, 20 years instead of like in the next 4 years about 0.5% of all the plastics in the world are biodegradable at the moment. Where are they made of? So what's the source of biodegradable stuff? Plants. What kind of plants? Specific. Let's say corn. Maybe. Yeah, corn. Mice, corn. Uh, after it's been here, it uh, produces it. Uh, they, they make it out starch. of starch, yeah, that's correct. So it's cloning a business, so we should be here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely correct. But the amount is very small, it's a tiny amount, and uh, there's, a, there's a food discussion going on, because corn, mice, oh. Eh, oh, yeah. is the major source of making PLA at the moment. So if we would all use biodegradable PLA, from now on, then we would have a real major issue when it comes to sourcing the material. So that's why we are fond of making use of your ex-toilet paper, because this uses a lot of energy in, a, in an installation where it's degraded and, and, and uh, put into clean water again. So it works double. You don't need the energy to um, degrade it, and you can use the resource to upgrade it. So that, that's, that's a double game. But even this wouldn't uh, cover the amount of sort, uh, material needed to, to, to make PLA. So we have to think in another way. Oil is a 100% solution. Yeah? And if you look at fuel in general, there are people that say, well, hydrogen is not the option, because it covers only a small amount, or uh, green gas is not the option, or cellulose is not the option to make uh, uh, PLA. But we have to rethink and, and, and uh, remind ourselves to the fact that 10 times 10 makes 100 also. So we, we need different sources, different materials to cover a problem. And what also is a problem, and we do it ourselves, we make this kind of stuff out of plastic. And what do you think about uh, making use of recycled plastics in this way? What's your opinion? If, if you make a bucket out of it. it. For me, it gives me the idea that you can only make a bucket out of recycled plastic. And I don't have, I have no emotion when it comes to a bucket. If I would have taken a bucket for you all and said, well, this is recycled material. Well, I wouldn't be that enthusiastic. So one step better, and this, this is what we do today, we make these small bins out of it. But still, it's a bit... Um, well, it's, it's not the way I would like to see plastics being recycled. Eh? So there's a lot to do. Um, who knows the law of uh, retention of... <laughs> we also call it the law of bakjes. <laughs> the wet van bakjes. Never heard of it? I haven't either, but I just thought of it uh, yesterday. <laughs> but it says something about when you have misery, it always remains. So, um, I try to tell you that there is a shift from household waste to residue. So, if you have a big heap of waste, 500 kilos per inhabitant, and we don't reduce our consumption, 
then the law of retention of misery kicks in. It'll always be the same, but we see it shifting from uh, the grey bin into the yellow bin or the blue bin or whatever. So keep the law of retention of misery in mind. I talked about this already. So uh, let me see. I, I have one more quiz for you because the prizes uh, have to uh, go out. <laughs> Where it, uh, <coughs> who, who has a limited uh, budget? <laughs> so, if you look at your shopping, where, where do you uh, do your shopping? Who, who goes to the Aldi? The little Albert Heijn? Oh, expensive. And uh, what do you buy in general if you have a limited budget? What? You eat meat? Uh, fast food. I do. Uh, since since uh, two weeks I'm eating a bit less, I suppose. <laughs> Why? Uh, well, we had a discussion about it and we were like, yeah, well, maybe there we should shave on yes. a day or two. Okay. Um, um, but I try to. Um, yeah, um, buy simple foods um, regularly, um, and um, some part of it is uh, bio uh, stuff. Bio stuff. So, so biological it's actually rather expensive. It's um, expensive. But yeah, I choose to, uh, according to well, um, what I have basically. <laughs> but what do you buy? Um, hmm. Usually grains. Fruits and vegetables. I try to buy most of it on the market. And uh, yeah, what really annoys me actually is that, for example, in other time, uh, everything organic. For example, fruits and vegetables. They're literally every each of them is packaged. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. absolutely one of them. Good point. So it annoys you because of the packaging material. As in, like if you have a option to. By not organic and without package, or organic and with package, then it's a bit like, conflicting. <laughs> if you look at a packaged paprika, or how do you say in English? Organic uh, packaged paprika. A pepper and a non packaged pepper. Is there a price difference? Who knows? And Oberheim. Eh? So I have these three peppers yellow, red, green combined in the package. And I have these loose peppers, these peppers that you can buy individual. The is that a price difference? Package is cheaper. Yeah. Yep. Package is cheaper. Why? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. No. You have thought about it. They're smaller, right? A smaller. <laughs> I I really don't know the answer, but I always think that it's pure emotion. When you are involved and, and thinking about the environment, I think you are likely to pay a bit more for the unpackaged one <laughs> than for the packaged one. I really think it's, it's that absurd. I'm not sure, but... Well, I think you saw this ad of the, the food society. Yeah. Oh, and there was this guy, he, he was saying that food uh, keeps fresh longer when it's packaged. So that's why we have Packaging around vegetables. And I don't know if that's true, but it just sounded ridiculous to me. But perhaps that's the reason why it's cheaper. Yeah, that could be. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert in, in, in that field, but it can be. But if I look at my own fridge, I always took those peppers and put them in the fridge, which is absolutely wrong. Because if you do them in the fridge, they lose their, their smell and their uh, taste and uh, they get a bit moisty and soft so if you preserve them out of the fridge normally in your kitchen on the the, 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 the round thing where you will put your vegetables <laughs> then they, in my case they, they, keep, they stay fresher than uh, if I put them in the fridge plastic wrap etc so 
I don't know the answer, but there, there is a big issue when it comes to food. So I skip a lot of this. Our food is made into um, soil, fertile soil. A oh. big problem. You will. Oh, sorry, just a question about the food, organic matter and the waste. Yeah. How, how efficient is it like uh, after uh, post separation? Like how good they manage to like separate the organic matter if it's already all yeah. like mixed? Well, this, th there, when it comes to post separation, I think paper and green waste has to stay this way. You have to, you can post separate it because it's very clean. We, we take out about 10% of impurities and the rest is being processed into, uh, <coughs> into uh, compost. I, I was responsible for building this factory a long time ago and we saw live chicken, a V8 Chevrolet uh, engine, uh, all put in this bin, so that was a real uh, miracle. But, but nowadays it's clean and you can reuse it almost 90% and make it into soil. I'm not going into this, but, but this will be something you will remember me telling you about this. This is the soil in Drenthe in summertime, 30 degrees, a lot of wind, and our topsoil is blowing away. This, this, this is a major problem for the future. Um, how much kg of uh, green uh, garbage is turning? How much kg is of compost? Uh, 80 kilos of uh, uh, green waste pro inhabited turns into 30 kilos of compost uh, when it's converted from green into compost. So a lot of moisture is involved and the moisture is evaporated and then some impurities so it's almost 50-60% that's evaporated and the rest is compost. This is a problem of the future. The, the, the soil in the Netherlands is getting worse and worse. It has all to do with a lot of manure that's put into the soil and the overproduction pro hectare. So, I won't go into it, but compost is the answer. So, there is a really need for fertile compost instead of fertilizer. Um, well, I told you something about the new business developments already, but I just want you to guess what this is. Like a magician. <laughs> Electrical cables? Yes. Electrical cables, yeah. That's correct. Mobile phones, hair dryers, vacuum cleaners, all that stuff that we put in the grey bin. At the end of the day, the bottom ash of an incinerator contains more copper than the richest mine in South Africa. So we take, <laughs> by leaching, we take out three and a half kilos of every thousand kilo of bottom ash. We leach it and we make copper out of the leached material. So more than a, than a mine in South Africa. This is part of the future as well. Um, proteins from insects, you know them already. Um, so let me skip that. That's the material from the sewer. So that's <laughs> the toilet paper we take out. The origin. Mm. How, how much toilet paper we use per year? Any idea? Shitload. <laughs> Shitload, yeah, for sure. 16 to 20 kilograms every person a year. Either we use the fibers or we use the chemical steps to go, for instance, into sugars. Skip that one. Uh, skip that one as well. Let me go to our last quiz. So, we have 15 minutes left. Prevention is the topic. What can you do 
to prevent waste being waste, becoming waste, so materials becoming waste. We talked about packaging material already. So what's another major issue to prevent waste? And we talked about it already. What can you do to prevent something becoming waste? I myself, or if I can yes. make it you as an individual. Um, I think I as an individual would be most affected if I just make my whole flat, for example, aware of uh, how much plastic we use and how much, and that there are other ways. And so then, yeah, then I can influence them as well, and then. As a house. Okay, so that's yes. very, very good. You want to influence <coughs> your, your whole community around you. But please start okay, yeah. <laughs> with yourself. What do you do to prevent um, waste? Well, if I just go to the market, for example. To the market, okay. And don't use plastic um, bags, but bring my own backpack with me and then put the Okay, so less packaging material. Uh, we eat a lot of breads and it always comes in a uh, plastic bag. If you just bring our own bag to the bakery and ask if they want to put it in the bag, then I think we will already uh, save a lot of plastic packaging. It's just one very okay. small step that could be normalized because it's not that difficult. Of course, so that's a good one. But again, packaging material. I want to go on a, another topic, so, so let's forget packaging material for the moment, but another way to, and, and to bring your limited budget into the equation as well. I just wanted to say that there's a package free stuff, uh, shop where you can buy your stuff. With your oh yeah, it's do. here in Groningen, isn't it? Yeah. There was one uh, last year which closed because people didn't, didn't use it, so now there's only the Neue Weg the new way. Um, it's also a biological shop, so it's not as cheap as uh, in the supermarket, but it's still cheaper than normal biological stuff because you can go there with your box. And uh, that's really simple and okay. really good food. And can you can you give us the link because or the address so we can all join yeah, yeah. the show? I don't know how, but yeah. Yeah, awesome. Uh, repair your clothes, for instance, right? Sorry? Re repair. Repair your clothes. Yeah. And what about food? Limited budget and food. My hobby. Who knows this? This is Albert Heijn. <laughs> so one of the more expensive shops in the, in the Netherlands. The 35% sticker. When do they use it? When it's uh, About due to, to today, you say. When it's due to today. Yeah, and, and uh, when is stuff but due to today? Uh, when their expiring date is today. Okay, how many expiring dates do we know? This is your topic from last week or two weeks ago. So how many dates do we know? Expired dates, forms of expired dates. Two different ones. Two different ones, which ones? Uh, the best before and the worst the other one. Up to user. Up to, yeah. Yeah. Use. Okay. So we have two forms of that. What's the difference between the one and the other? <coughs> so, in an example, I have the best before date, and I give it to you now, and it's the, the date is yesterday, so would you consume it? For the next two weeks, I think I would. For the next two weeks, you would. And now, I have the other date, so uh, I, and I always have to think about them as well. I'll come to yeah, back with. But the other one is for things like chicken and fish, and the recommendation is not to use it after the date because hygiene and and, and stuff. But this brings you a lot of money as well, and I always wonder. This is my hobby, yeah. So <laughs> when, when, when I'm in time. <laughs> uh, be before closing Albert Heijn, and I'm driving home, I always score 35%. Yeah. 
because it <laughs> saves me in my, in my budget. And then I see younger people, and for instance, uh, this cucumber, there is one very close to me with 35%, and somebody <laughs> lays it away and takes a fresh one. Then why would you do so? Why, who, who buys 35% material? Oh, oh, the rich to the other hand, right? The THT, the minste by tot, so at least to be used until, best before date, check the product, it's always no critical material. Once I found a package of salt, kitchen salt, which has been in Mother Earth for million and million of years, and then somebody thinks about the fact that we have to put a 35% sticker on it because the best before date. So that was the most ridiculous thing I ever bought with 35%. Eh? Salt cannot be uh, better or worse than it is in the stadiums. And then to gebruik een tot, to be used before. And that's more critical. So, you have to think about using that a bit more than the other one. But there is an organoleptic assessment which helps you. Does it stink? <laughs> does it look good? And at the end, does it taste good? And that's, that's the, the best way to assess your stuff. So, if you go for the 35%, don't go to this shop because that's my territory. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want too much competition. And I think it's also important to start even earlier with the mindset that we are not used to spend money on food anymore, but actually, like, because we know the prices from Lidl and Aldi, so we don't know really what, what it's worth it. And if you would just drink like a few beers less in the pub or do small things, then you would not necessarily need to only buy the cheapest stuff. Oh yeah, for I sure. think like priorities are a big topic as well, but um, yeah, that you could also just spend more money on food. Yes, you can. But I read that, and, and I, that's what I see in our company, that about 30% of all the food produced is not used as food for human consumption. And uh, there are all kinds of rules that prevent us from 35% or outdated food to bring it back into the chain. For instance, uh, uh, large animal food like, like uh, cows and pigs, they cannot take this food because of rules. And the gekke koeienziekte, so BSA we called it, the, 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 the cows that got crazy with this uh, certain uh, microorganism in, 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 in food and the varkens pest, eh, so the, the, the issue with the pigs that all that, that were killed because of this uh, illness, that's all related to making use of food that is outdated in the, in, in the uh, live animal industry. Um, and, and even people with a very limited budget. Eh, um, they cannot get this for free, also because of rules. So if Albert Heijn would like to give it to people with a very, very limited budget, they are not allowed. So 30% is a lot, don't you think? It's an awful lot. So that's what I would suggest, uh, first of all, prevent. And if you cannot prevent, then make use of the stuff that, well, needs uh, a consumption after all, before it's thrown away and uh, not reused. Maybe vote for a party that uh, is more strict in their rules, <coughs> in terms of uh, environmental legislation. Mm -hmm. That's what we can all do, and uh, especially as soon as there is an alternative to something polluting, I don't think, I don't see why we should not start taking action yeah. to uh, uh, 
And I think there are these kind of rules, like in cars now they are not allowed to, to put, to use uh, uh, seats, covers that cannot be recycled or something like that. So you can be proactive in terms of uh, uh, thinking about what How things buy. are constructed mm -hmm. that they can be recycled, and of course that has uh, cost, but that is an uh, innovation. I yeah. Think. Um, I heard that aluminium is is a material that is very you can recycle it very well. Are are you doing anything with that material? Yes, actually, the biggest carbon dioxide uh, reduction is achieved by reusing non-ferro materials. So not only aluminium, but all the non-ferro materials, they take a lot and a lot of energy to being produced at all. Could you explain ferro? Oh, ferro. So um, everything that's magnetic is a ferro metal. And non-ferro metals are not magnetic, like aluminium, and uh, that's the difference. We, we, we always, because if we separate metals in general, then you have two techniques. An eddy current technique, which is for the non-magnetic materials, and you have magnets. So it, it, it's a separation issue as well. But the non-magnetic materials, so the non-ferros, in general take a lot of energy to be produced. So aluminium has to be melted at uh, up to 700 degrees, and if it's foiled, it's uh, temperatured up to 1200 degrees. <coughs> so you can imagine the enormous amount of energy involved if you make aluminium foil. But who, who has an idea? What, what's, what's your summary of what I to, try to tell you today, and what, what's what would be your suggestion to <coughs> make a better world when it comes to waste? <coughs> yeah, well, I think we should be more uh, use materials that are easily recycled, like glass or uh, cans or uh, aluminium uh, yeah, than plastics, for example. Mm -hmm. I, I think you could wrap your meat into aluminium or as well as in the plastic, that is better for the environment. Mm -hmm. what, what would be a downside of wrapping your meat at Albert Heijn in foil, in, in aluminium foil? Because it's more visible? Yeah, I think that's a major issue. Because Albert Heijn don't want you to recognize a pig, but they want you to assess your meat. And that's that's why the the foil is involved. But what what can we do to to make a better world when it comes to work? Well, I was impressed by this uh, film because apparently innovation, so scientific research in how to to do the job of recycling, is brought a lot of results already. So maybe. When we have more of that type of research, we can improve our techniques. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was chemist? Um, yeah, no, I'm actually quite like I think my lifestyle is already. Um, I spend a li little bit of research on my own on it, and it's a bit of effort, but it's doable for, for everyone, I think. And um, I I also have only a student budget, but I still manage to to buy local stuff to buy. Uh, non-packaged stuff and it's not really a big thing it's just the mindset that you think it's complicated and it doesn't work but I can just say it's it's working and it's just about priorities and about uh, yeah, taking action now and not postponing and um, yeah concrete things are than package free shop or just do not like you are led by by uh, you want to have pleasure or whatever with uh, stuff you buy, but uh, if you overcome this idea of, oh, this chocolate will make me happy, then it already helps a lot to just consume what you really need, and that's not so difficult. And I also start to, to grow my own things and to produce my own products, and 
that takes a bit of time, of course, not everyone has that, and not everyone is interested in doing that, but uh, it's not a big thing, mm. for me, mm. at least. Why, why, why is local then important? Also because of the environment, and uh, I mean, we talked about it two weeks ago, I think, a lot, that already made clear why it's important. Um, there are many reasons. Mm. But it has a lot to do with local economics as well, but less transport. Okay. And, uh, and also, when you buy them directly there, you don't need the package in between and the storage. Yeah. Yeah, Very good. Yeah. Any other ideas? First of all, I want to thank you very much because you took the time to talk to us, and for sure, because you make such an effort to care about waste. But as I see, we got one efficiency rate of one third, either concerning plastic or organic waste and something, which is even in this very clean environment, very, uh, very artificial environment in the West, very difficult to, to reach very good um, efficiency, right? And takes a huge amount of money to do so. One billion for one plant for only 600,000 tons of plastic. So I wonder how this would be possible in, in third world countries. Well, which I don't want to call them third world countries because they are higher developed than we are in terms of mind and morals. Um, but they have much more waste where we are responsible for. Because it was our people who introduced plastic to the world. Mm -hmm. And not Nigeria, not India, not, not Brazil. And uh, yeah, so. I don't know. Um, maybe you can tell me: Is there some kind of cooperation between your company and, and other countries, or is there support for other countries, which essentially I think should also be voluntarily? And I mean, we are responsible for the waste. Oh so yes, we should pay for it. Not very good else. point. Very good point. Who, who would like to answer his statement, answer, or, or reflect on his statement that we introduced? The pollutants into the third world and we politely ask them to put a lot of money in the recycling of stuff that we introduced. So who wants to make a remark on that? Yeah, that's a really good point. I've never thought about it that way, but now you put it that way, that's really... Yeah. I, we, I should be, uh, we should be one staying them to recycle their waste. Because now if you come in a country like that, and all the waste is just in lands, it's everywhere, there's no system to pick it up or anything, it's really, uh, it's really sad. And you don't agree? Well, maybe I'm not suitable for my job, but I'm teaching development studies, and I think these people have their own responsibilities, they choose for it. But we so it's them. not our responsibility to solve the plastic everywhere, it's also their responsibility, and they... I think we can assist very much, especially with the expertise on how to do it, but uh, <coughs> uh, I mean you don't have to teach the Chinese consumption culture, That's, they developed it themselves, they are crazy in consumption. So we are not responsible for everything that is happening in the world, uh, of course we, we keep some systems in place that are very bad. But they have their own responsibility and their, uh, their own actions. There is also some knowledge on the consequences of all that consumption pattern that maybe another country won't know. And maybe the persons won't have the preparation or education to know. Like yeah. they're just buying a lot of things in plastic and they just have no idea what plastic actually, yeah. like the consequences of uh, consuming that much plastic is going to be. So in that sense, I don't know. There could it's be very like more useful to assist them, but it's not a moral obligation because we invented plastic. I don't think. Yeah, this argument is superseded by the idea that we are all Earthlings, right? Like Monsal <laughs> talked about, and there is really no issue when you say like ah, us and them because we are all in this together, we're in this shitstorm, like it or not. So you could say like, well, but you were first, but that's just. Uh, a childish argument in the end. Um, again, nature doesn't care about this, but uh, I do agree that obviously there is some moral... Uh, but, but it's a fact. Eh? I was in Indonesia for a year ago, 
And I really was astonished about the enormous amount of plastic waste yeah. in the ocean. Mm -hmm. I wasn't on a ferry, eh? and I, I, as a seaman, I'm very interested in ferries. <laughs> so th it, it was a jet propulsed ferry, which went something like uh, 60, 70 kilometers an hour. Eh? So I was really enjoying the ride. <laughs> but this guy that was on the bridge, the, the ship went boom, like this and boom, like that. I thought, what, what the hell? Is he drunk? So I asked the sailor, can I, can I have a look on the bridge? He said, yes, of course, join me. So we went up the bridge and I spoke to the captain. And the moment I entered the bridge, I knew what the problem was. Any idea? This guy was navigating like this. Plastic to, island. Hmm? Plastic. Plastic islands. Really? I was shocked. There were debris fields as big as 10, 15 meters round. And the sea was filled with it. And the only thing he was doing was circumnavigate all these debris fields. And it was 60 miles this trip. And I saw 60 miles of plastic debris and all kind of shit. And that was only one very small part of the Chinese Sea. But it's huge. So we have a problem. And again, the statement is, we introduce this problem. So. Yes, I want to come back to your argument. Uh, you said that we shouldn't point fingers. However, we do have the financial resources to uh, introduce a system in these countries that can help these people to uh, recycle their waste. And these countries don't even have the money to provide their, uh, their people with health care. So what do you think? Um, well, the best export product we have, I suppose, since we are more developed, um, is education. Because mindset is very important. When we have, like in uh, India, a problem where people take medicine for all, uh, when they can, because they feel a little bit um, um, worse than they uh, should then you uh, um, um, introduce all kinds of problems like resi uh, resistance uh, buildup in, uh, in fungi and stuff. These people need to know what their uh, um, actions um, do in the end. Just like we have the same problem. People here also don't know what their actions eventually will lead to. These loops are way too big. We, we can't see what our actions do in the end. And people should be educated more on what it does because then they can feel more responsible for the actions. And then it doesn't really matter where, uh, where, whether you are very poor or very rich. It doesn't really matter that much. In, in most senses, probably uh, poor people will have a uh, definite advantage there to people who are really rich and really have no clue why they buy six or seven cars, etc. So I think education is very, very much important there, and not necessarily the economic uh, value of, say, a, a uh, random amount of money that is flowing around the country. Okay, thank you very much. I, I, this is a very interesting discuss discussion, and perhaps I would have uh, needed to start this sooner. But I, I, I hope, I wish, you will continue this discussion uh, throughout your uh, coming courses and find the answer. Small part of the answer for me lays in the world upside down at the moment. I think we live in the world upside down. We need subsidies, schemes, to make green energy. We need subsidy to recycle plastics. We, um, and in the same time, for instance here in Groningen, if you look 30 kilometers up to the north, there is the biggest coal-fired plant in Europe <laughs> making fossil electricity at this moment at a price of about 2 to 3 cents per kilowatt hour. 
You know what you pay at home for your electricity? 20. 20 cents per kilowatt hour. So, for a ship price, we produce fossil energy in a coal-fired plant at the same position we have to make the dikes three meters <coughs> higher because of the carbon dioxide problem and the sea level rising and stuff like that and who pays for making the dikes higher? You! <coughs> but we don't call it energy tax no, it's from the water boards and, and who pays for the recycling of plastics at this moment? You! <laughs> Because you pay tax, or you will go pay tax, <laughs> and it's the world upside down. So, I think the polluters have to pay the social costs involved in making use of fossil energy and resources and stuff like that. As long as we can compensate it by subsidy schemes, we are lost. So, that's my message. I have to stop now because of the time. The prizes, you want a prize? <laughs> this is made out of, uh, out of uh, recycled cellulose. Thank you. You, uh, you all have a fantastic contribution, but I have to be sure. You can only keep your sustainable dossiers in this product. It's not allowed to make use of it any other. I'm sorry, I don't have one for everybody.